now for this uh, this session we will have two talk and uh, <coughs> I, uh, the next one will be given by Karen Yan for a talk and and title so I am difficulty speaking English today tool afforded causal reasoning in neurophysiology thank you please, please go. um Thanks to uh, Alexandra and Charles for organizing this uh, workshop and I'm very happy the arrangement this morning falls beautifully because Michelle talks about you know one way to get out this uh, magnet philosophical uh, literature is maybe we can reconceptualize top-down uh, experiment intervention and then uh, really offer another way to go beyond is to well let's focus on scientific exploration explore exploration of causation. And here I'm going to offer another way out of that literature is to focus on the role of uh, experimental tools uh, plays in causal reasoning. Hence the tool afforded causal reasoning is the title of my talk. So to begin with, uh, if you're familiar with the literature of um, uh, mechanism of explanation, uh, for example, uh, John Bico, they published a book then uh, they're focusing on, so neuroscientists rely on designing experiments and uh, to account to, to, to perform their causal reasoning. And then a lot of uh, philosophers of neuroscience have been focusing on um, analyzing different types of experiments. So for example, Beagle have their book, uh, and, and, and they categorize different types of uh, experiments and, and the, the part relevant to causal reasoning is connection experiments. And um, Quaver and Darling in their 2013 book, and then they the part that's specifically relevant to causal reason, reasoning is the, the their analysis about experiments for uh, testing causal relevance. Um, but all this literature, uh, less um, sorry, more on the uh, experimental design type and less on the experimental tools themselves. And the only reason exception is. The only exception is this uh, book just published last year, and here they start like um, refocusing, center the role of exper experimental or tools in general, uh, and their relationship to neuroscientific experiment. And here, this paper, what I want to focus on, which is not talked a lot in this book, uh, but what what, is, what I'm going to focus on in this paper is that exactly what the role of experimental tools play in causal reasoning. And I have two theses to propose today. The first one is the affordance of the experimental tools enables or constrains neurophysiologists' causal reasoning capacity. Moreover, some causal norms are intertwined with uh, experimental tools. What I mean by intertwined means that without this you know, detailed affordance uh, this, of these uh, experimental tools, uh, you cannot specify this causal norm, and you are not able to um, exercise the capacity to uh, satisfy the causal norm. That's what I mean by intertwined. And if we can find causal reasoning norm in the way I, I, I show you how experiment tools enable constrain your scientist's uh, reasoning, it actually has a crucial methodological implication for philosophers which comes to my second thesis today. If philosopher ends to abstract causal reasoning norm from <coughs> neuroscientific uh, scientific practice, which is the practice uh, term for a lot of philosophy science now, they have a focus on practice, and if the goal is to abstract the causal norm, um, how should they proceed? This is a meta method methodological question that I want to propose. So I want to make a distinction between theory first approach versus tool first approach. So theory first approach, uh, so you see many philosophers actually uh, fall under this approach that they will use some theory or framework about causal reasoning. For example, the famous interventionist account of causation to guide the philosophical analysis of scientific practice. So they may go into some detailed scientific case and then start applying this theory to see if ah, this practice you know, actually provide causal explanations or actually is a uh, acceptable, adequate causal instance of causal reasoning. But the tool first approach would be like, hey, wait a second, we don't really have a theory going to the, the practice, going to the field. We just you know, dive into the experiment field and to investigate how tools enable and constrain their reasoning. And we try to abstract that causal norm from the detail of the practice. 
So hence the second thesis of the talk today is that in some, I'm not claiming all, in some experimental contexts, it's actually more beneficial to use the tool, tool first approach to understand and abstract this relevant scientific causal reasoning, specifically for the field where they just don't have the exemplary, exemplary uh, causal investing strategy. For example, the system neuroscience I'm following, they're still figuring out how to put everything together. Uh, from the gene, gene technique, from the uh, electrical recording, <coughs> and plus epigenetics, and plus other stuff. They try to put everything together in one set of experiment. And they don't know how, they don't need to f figure out how to work. So it's very similar to Ray's idea about the scientific exploration of uh, causation. So all like right today, I'm going to show three case study, three causal investment strategy uh, here on the CIS. But due to the time limit, I'm going to skip this one because I think the real philosophical me is in this two uh, part by my, my argument. So I'm going to show you how it's enabled by recording tool and how it's enabled by simulation tool. And use this two to uh, support the two thesis I mentioned earlier. So first case is the causal reasoning enabled by recording tools. So here I want to make a distinction for those who may read a lot of uh, mechanics literature. You will see a lot of case that the Craver, for example, provide. It's from coming from cellular molecular experiments. But the, the one I'm focusing on is actually from the neurophysiological experiment. They do this kind of neural recording, single neural recording, and sometimes plus epigenetics to, to intervene the uh, uh, single neurons. Uh, usually they use mice. And so this is the, their, their tool, their method, and it's very different from this uh, cellular molecular experiment. So I just want to put it out front so people uh, know the, they're actually very different experiments. And so one common challenge for neurophysiology is that they have to like insert electrode to, into the brain to record neuron. And then uh, by inserting it, they will break the membrane, and so the signal will leak, and then the data is messy, and then they have to figure out how to uh, deal with the, those like noisy, dirty, messy data. And the one tool have been um, invented is this uh, by the uh, Nobel Prize winner. It's called Patch Clamp Recording Tool. And what it does is that it's able to make a tie seal between the electrode and the part of the membrane. So it looks actually like this, that this is electrode, and then you let, and it attacks the membrane, and then you let, that keep the sucking out the, it make it really seal here, so the, the fluid and iron, iron and iron will now leak, in. and then so the recording here will be very clean, well, really cl uh, clean uh, compared to the, the old-fashioned way. And so this tool is very important because they, they enable neurophysiology to collect low noise signal with a very low probability of arti artificial signal which is the biggest challenge in neurophysiology because they have to deal with uh, how to uh, make sure that the signal they're using to do the analysis is not an <coughs> artifact. And then the, the tool I'm going to talk about today is actually a called wholesale patch plan recording. So I'm going to here show them as a WPR. And just a one configuration of the patch recording tool I mentioned earlier. And what the difference is that once they complete this part, they do another uh, section to break the membrane. So they can get fluid here, they can have the more like wholesale situation and that makes uh, it useful for determining the overall, overall property of neuron when they focus on the, this one single neuron. What does it do at what time? And then what they do is that with that tool, they have the experiment which is in visual. Just they record it on the brain slice and they record six neurons at the same time. So the, 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 the distinct uh, uh, feature here is that they record six neurons at the same time to test like, the neural, uh, which neurons send exactly uh, uh, the electrical signal to, to another one. So because they record at the same time and the signal are very clean, uh, clean so they, they can say, I ingest something, activate here. And then they can see, if I pick up from here, then they can infer that there's a, a excitatory uh, connection from neuro one to neuro six. And I will shorten this part of the MSE, meaning that this is a visual recording doing the six neurons simultaneously. Um, okay, so this part. Okay, so here's the philosophical punchline here. 
So we have this tool. We have this experiment. I'm going to run you three scenarios to show you that how the tool enable neuroscientists to conduct specific type of control. So let's consider scenario one, which is a typical uh, and virtual recording experiment that uh, they're not using that tool, I said. You can seal and get clean, clean uh, signal. What they usually do, they just uh, insert the electron to, to this uh, brain size. And they could simultaneously pick up multiple signal from multiple neurons. And what they do, they do afterward analysis by applying uh, statistical software to average data, do some like a, a component, anal component analysis. Anyway, using statistics to solve the problem, to make the data better, less noisy. Uh, that's, a, that's a typical uh, regular situation. With the tool, with that uh, wholesale patch plane recording tool, they can actually just perform their data analysis directly on the neural signal they pick up because the neural signal is supposed to be just exactly what this neuron is doing at that time. They pick it up that way. They can just perform their causal reasoning on the data. And if we take out this uh, tool and just focus on, oh, if you just have that experience, record <coughs> six neurons simultaneously, um, you could do that. But uh, if your data is not collected through WPR, then you are not able to uh, actually uh, perform your causal reason directly on the data. So this is, in this sense, the combination of MMC and WPR enable your scientists to do this specific kind of causal reasoning about whether uh, uh, neural ones have this excitatory connection to the neural six, for example. And so, in this sense, I want to so I want to uh, argue that the causal reasoning actually enabled by this combination, uh, NPR and the MSE, and then um, yeah, let's just summarize what I say. So, and then I actually want to uh, propose this um, intertwined causal norm in the recording experiments because normally, if you're neurophysiology, it's almost like 101 uh, basic uh, <coughs> common sense for for let's say grass in the, in the lab learning how to do it, like you don't do this in fur. You don't, you don't think that, oh, there's a connection, information flow from one neuro to two neuro, uh, another neuro, and then you can say there are causal connections. There's so much confounding factors you have to control in order to make that claim. But with this tool and the combination of the experiment, they actually can use this norm which is a frown upon norm at the be for the beginner, but with the tool, with the experiment, in the right setting, in the right context, you can infer that way. You see the connection, you can safely, confidently claim that, oh, this is a causal connection. Then the second case I'm gonna show is how it's enabled by simulation tool. But before I get to that, I have to, I, I skip some detail, but then I still need to tell you that, okay, they, something happened in the middle. Let's skip the episode two. And then uh, they form a causal hypothesis, and now they need to test this causal hypothesis. But the problem is that, well, the actual brain circuit in this mouse, uh, mice is very complex. How do you test this causal hypothesis? You don't have the tool to in intervene a very complex neuro, neuro circuit. So how do they do it? Well, here comes this simulation tool to help them to do their work. So here, I want to show you that this uh, scientific team, their causal reasoning is actually um, afforded by the tool they use, which allow them to construct actual and not actual network models of neurons. And the causal norm is actually intertwined. It's a specific kind of simulated intervention they can do by this tool. And so the tool for the uh, counterfactual reasoning uh, is what I want to uh, uh, elaborate through this uh, simulation uh, tool because uh, if you are, want to intervene a very complex uh, uh, neural network in the brain, uh, it's too complex and even I want to do some counterfactual reasoning with the data set I have, which is like all the, you know, they record so many brain slides, each brain slide records six neurons, <coughs> the data set is massive. And if you want to do your counterfactual reasoning with the data set, unfortunately like our brain is just not that powerful to do this kind of uh, counterfactual. So you need tool, and the tool is a simulation tool. So what they do is that they use, they of course, you know, use computer, they 
they use their original experimental data to construct this experimental network in the in the in the uh, in in their computer. And so this is like uh, you can think as a computer analog of the actual actual network in the brain. And then they then have simulate they simulate another they call mean network, which is uh, they actually. Uh, uh, tweak the excitatory uh, synaptic connection to some specific mean value. So sound is really high, and they treat it, they, they reset it to the to the specific value they set. And this is called big uh, UEPS mean network. Is that they remove a lot of it and only leave the excitatory uh, connection that's above certain um, value, and that's the big network. And then why is this helping them to test the hypothesis? Because this is the, the signature uh, feature of the Layer four neurons. They think it's probably responsible for driving that actual potential they, they found in that brain circuit. So they want to see the this. Uh, they want to see the uh, differences among the three. So then they compute the required minimum number of a synchronously active uh, neuron to drive further electrical potential. And this is their result that the the um, analog of the actual uh, experimental data set require uh, uh, roughly 30 neurons. And if they send a mean value, that should double, at least double. And the big US is almost similar, close enough. So they use this, uh, this reasoning to say that, OK, they can use the, the simulation result to support, support their hypothesis that, yes, it's the layer 4 neuron mainly drive the uh, next actual potential in the network. Okay, so right now, um, here comes the, the discussion about uh, this specific type of simulation, simulated intervention I found in my case study and how it connects with the traditional philosophical literature on the interventionist causation. So this causal reasoning, uh, or you call simulated intervention, though appears to have an interventionist spirit, but it, you actually cannot use this philosophical account to understand it. Why is that? Well, let's go back to this famous diagram from, from uh, um, Craver. Um, so to skip the, the detail, basically, that this is the intervention. And this is what you want to prove that there's a, there's a the x cost y. And then you want to use the intervention to provide them to, to set x cost y. And it basically now allows to have this, this four condition happen. OK. And uh, the problem is that in the experiment I just showed you, um, they change or remove the excitatory synaptic connection in their simulated network, the mean network and the big UEPSP network. So this is actually like violating the condition, the I2 is violated because you actually move, remove, or change the causal intermediate. But uh, this intervention is, is required at the network level but evaluate I3. Oh, sorry, I2. I need to the type of view. And then, but it's critical for them to instantiate the kind of uh, intervention they want at the neuron, ne neural level. So the intervention is do it at the network as a whole. But they want to see that by doing this, they can, for example, the big USB, USB network is that they intervene the whole network. And the result is that they can keep only that layer four neural signal uh, crucial feature and see if it, the, the, this still observed. And so that's the reason. Okay. Let's skip this one. <coughs> so, um, <coughs> so I think the reason they can perform this kind, this type of uh, intervention is because the simulation tool afford that one hundred percent computational persistence and control, which is not available in the so-called web experiment. Um, and that allows them to do this kind of intervention that's not typically captured or imagined by the philosophical literature when they just think about intervention with the more like common sense scenario. And so have, I want to uh, propose another uh, in, in, intertwined causal norm based on this uh, simulation experiment, experiments that 
there, which, which uh, in this case we can understand that there is actually a simulated intervention I um, X is in this case is actually the rare uh, amplified UVPSP of their group. With respect to why is how many neurons required to drive a further electrical potential in that one. So this simulated intervention I on X is a tool for this simulated change. In the value X that change Y. So here I'm just basically readjusting the typical formulation of the interventionist account position uh, by making it uh, tool afforded as, as part of the necessary future plus a more contextual uh, um, condition here is that the acceptability of the tool for the simulated change is actually a kind of sensitive feature depending on which your experimental context and the kind of computation involved. Because you know, this is just one case of how simulation tool is applied to neurophysiology. I imagine there are multiple, so many different types you can discover in scientific practice. But nonetheless, the key idea is that this norm builds in this tool for the future from the tool. Okay, so the ending, uh, the ending take home message is that uh, if what, I analysis, what my analysis show is correct, then this shows that the case, the case that they present is actually better to be approached by tool first approach is that in this case, philosopher's job description is actually is to distill a philosophical theory causation by carefully examining the contextual and processual detail of experimental practice that frontier scientists engage in generally proving the causal norm prototype. Because those frontier sci scientists, they don't have the already established consensus about how you go around doing your causal reasoning. They are exploring, they're figuring out. And in that case, tool first approach is better and we can help them to abstract that general pattern they have considered successful in their practice. But the theory first approach can work in some cases. I'm not denying, for example, if you go into some RCT um, clinical literature, it's pretty clear you can just apply a theory of RCT then to understand the causal reason. This is what they do to themselves as well. So theory first approach still works some, uh, in some cases. But if we put this apart, then I think it will give more room to more the philosopher books on scientific practice to position their work in this direction. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Karen. Very, very stimulating work. Thank you. I wonder if you would agree to the following picture. Uh, well, I hope you, you won't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank so, you for telling me the question. It's a trap question. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so the picture will be the following. So it's about the domain neutrality issue. Mm. So um, uh, I wonder if you would agree that there is a set of um, ideal pr uh, principles for ideal causal reasoning. So about uh, how uh, ideally a causal claim is established. And that is domain neutral. And that is, will be used in different contexts, for example, also in, in, in statistical software, I, I, I assume they used R or something like this, uh, uh, contains algorithms that basically uh, are based on, this, uh, on these principles of ideal uh, causal reasoning. But then we have the problem that in various sciences, um, ideal causal reasoning doesn't work. <laughs> because uh, the uh, uh, ideality conditions are not, are not yeah. satisfied. So you cannot intervene in the way in which ideal cause, the principles of, uh, of ideal causal reasoning would require it. Mm. So scientists come up with all kinds of fixes to fix uh, the, <coughs> the, 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 the problems mm -hmm. of, their, of their causal inferences. Um, which are due to the fact that they are not like in the ideal case. But, however, it could still be, and, and, and that is different. So the fixes uh, applied by scientists will be different. Mm -hmm. will be, uh, how do you call it, uh, something, a tool afforded. Yeah. They will be tool afforded. And I, 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 I think this is a great, a great concept, to tool afforded causal reasoning. Fabulous. Uh, I, 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 I'm totally on board with that. I just wonder if you would agree that there is nonetheless a set of ideal causal reasoning principles to which all these different tool afforded methods, um, as it were, um, aspire. So it's kind of a regulative ideal 
that um, scientists try to get close to, they will never get close to. Their, uh, their methods will always have uh, suffer from, 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 from defects, it will always be non-ideal, but still they all use the same ideal uh, in order uh, as, a, as a, a sort of a, a norm uh, that they try to get closer to. Now, is, is that something that uh, you would agree with? Uh, I'm kind of hoping that you're not. <laughs> I'm not. You're not? Great, yeah. great. So, so but I can, get, I can give a longer answer. But the short answer is no. <laughs> of course, no. <laughs> I mean, coming up as a, as a like more pragmatism-oriented um, uh, uh, position, uh, I want to like repost the question by uh, to those who are actually f hoping I say yes. I know a lot of philosophers probably hoping me to say yes to this to Michelle's question, but I want to I want to say that what we need to think about what what's the use of having that in the first place? It's good for scientists to have that like uh, a cross board, very unifying ideal, and that really instructive for them to do their work, communicate with each other. Um, I doubt it. And then, okay, maybe good for philosophers that because we like unifying theory. But do we really, as a, as a philosopher, want to have a more fruitful uh, relationship with science, scientists and to you know show that our philosophy can really engage and possibly improve and help with their their practice? This unifying really help us do our job as a philosopher of science. I also doubt it. So. One. Quick follow-up. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's that's absolutely fine. I just wonder how, how do you then explain the fact that um, statistical software like R mm -hmm. uh, and and its its causal inference tools that they can be used in very diverse disciplines. So they're used by neurophysiologists as well as by uh, economists and so, social scientists. So so it seems that these these tools and their machine implementations of, of causal reasoning, they seem to be very versatile. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how, how would you explain that? Yeah, so versatile is the, is the key keyword. Right. I think uh, we, we, when we think about the statistical tool, um, I think we need to refrain from thinking they are really like the off-shelf application. Mm -hmm. Like uh, there's like a uh, regression analysis, do do. Because a lot of the, uh, one, the, a lot of uh, scientists were actually uh, important part is the how they interpret the result of their statistical analysis, and that interpretation is where like they can they will bring in their background knowledge, some of their implicit norm, uh, also about maybe the specific specific characteristic of their the system they are uh, investigating. If because suppose it's um, it's mice it's a uh, mice versus uh, it's a C elegant. It's different, and so I, I feel like the 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 fact that those uh, statistical tool they apply in so many places will not. I, I think that that's very welcome phenomenon, and that doesn't mean the causal reasoning will just look like the same because they apply the same statistical. <coughs> okay. mm. Thanks. So may I ask a two-part question? So the, the as long as it's not trap question. No, 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 no. The first question is. How do you, as a philosopher, study the scientists working with tools? Uh, I go to their lab. I directly uh, see how they use it. That's how I do it. Okay. Mm. So the follow-up is that I get pretty itchy when someone talks about making these kinds of conclusions based on the tools. Mm. Especially when you're careful to say that a lot of this depends on the affordances granted by the tools. By which we mean that the tool, from where it is originally, from the context in which it's originally invented, mm -hmm. is being readapted to yes. a different set of experimental systems. Definitely. Mm -hmm. In which case, I don't think you're talking about tools anymore. But you're rather talking about Methods and methodology, and when we're taught, and this is a, this is a point that Yudhish Kara makes has been making her career, which is that method and methodology 
is all talk and argument and has less to do with the nature of the tool itself. So to your issue of, so, so to this question of, well, they're not just taking some statistical package off the shelf, right? The reason they're not taking it off the shelf is because they have conversations and debates about the particular method required to make the tool answer the kinds of questions they want to answer. So my, I'm, I'm, basically, I'm basically encouraging you to say, yes, I agree with the, the <laughs> overall analysis, but the tool, I think, needs to fade into the background a little bit for you to avoid accusations of being uh, an instrumental determinist, essentially. The instrument of a determinist? Yeah. Uh, can you elaborate that term a little to bit? To say that the instrument determines the outcome of the argument. Because what you're actually saying is that the scientists are engaged in methods talk and have overarching methodological interests or methodological preferences or there, there's some there's some noun in here floating around that I can't think of like grass. Right? So to shift from, and I'll give an example of this in my talk as well, but to shift from instrument to methods and methodology, I think would put you on some safer ground and give you some opportunities to look at Oh, how are the sun? How is it that in a given experiment, a tool is wiggled? I think it's a word. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a hard time to put this two turn yeah. uh, and see there that you can reason from the fact that I said affordance and you think that implied determinism. Because to me, no, maybe, it doesn't. It doesn't. Yeah. So, why I, one way to think, I think the, the, if there's a real philosophical, uh, difference here is whether affordance, the, the relation between tool for affordance first and the instrumental determinants that you worry about and might be accused of. And the rest of it could, I, could be conceptual issue that um, what you like to talk to, say as a method, I like to call it as a tool. But that said that said, because that's a boring issue. This is real, because uh, I don't want to be accused of, of committing to instrumental determinism, of course. Um, the tool of affordance, the way I use the concept, um, I feel that already shows that, it, okay, patch claim tool. Well, let's say aside, let's just don't debate whether this, you think that's a, that's a assume for the second argument, it is a tool. Not invented for neurophysiology. Of course, yes. That's, that's what I mean. Okay. That it, they, it they don't have the inventor in status. Context. Yes. And when it moves contexts. But that is the nature of the neuroscience. Neuroscience never have their own tools to begin with. That's just what neuroscience is. And that is what the, the neuroscientists I, I work with, they keep telling me, it's very interesting for now in neuroscience. They don't really have their own tools. They always borrow tools from other fields. But to say because you borrow tool from other 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 field, then you are not using tool. I think that's a bit too much. No, I'm not saying they're yeah. not using tools. Mm. I'm saying as they bring in a new tool, mm -hmm. a new so let's say instrument, right? As they bring in a new instrument, they need to engage in discussions about how to use it. And they are doing it. in and my that case that is I mean, methods yeah. talk. Okay. Is what I, is how I would be. Okay. So if I can just reformulate, because there seems to be a problem for the last two, three minutes, is that for you a tool is a, an element in the argumentation, in the general discussion. It's not a thing that has certain determination no. like you. I think the tool is a passion. And it seems that in your talk you were more going. So he, he want me to say when the neuroscientists adopt this uh, patch can t uh, recording tool to record a nice neuron, I'm talking about methods. I'm not talking about tool anymore. Or some that, that's what he wants to, to get suggest. 
yeah. Okay, I'll think about that. And then if you can send me the reference about like the to clarify this notion of instrument method, the differences, I really appreciate. It. Thank you. Richard, my question is actually considering. I think as the tool first or theory first, there's a uh, very clear distinction between them, depending on whether or not you have sufficient decomposing methods. So bringing instruments or tools into, uh, for example, uh, neurophysiology is because they don't have way to deconfirm what they want to deconfirm. There's a lot of potential confirm. So you mentioned once or twice deconfirming. I think that's the major thing. And since they have no way to deconfirm those potential confounders, so tools or instruments are essential. Are essential. So in that sense, it's deconfirming. That's, that's why then you can use theory, because it's already become, they, they almost find all the potential confounders, so they're, they're, there's no problem to use the theory. But why in the neurophysiology? Because they, they have no way to do that. So they have to even create those instruments to try to find a way to deconfound or even detect potential confounders. So I think in that sense, tool first is actually a method first to try to find deconfounding methods. And I think that's the thing. But but then, because it's so frontier, so finding the uh, uh, the right instruments or even inventing right instruments are essential. Yes, agree. But basically, it's for this That's that's my comment. Hmm. Okay. Thanks for the suggestion. Go home. Think about. It. There's no yeah. okay, questions. I very much like the idea of tool of worded counterfactual reasoning, especially because counterfactual approaches have this problem of what's the relevant kind of information that we should be looking at. So, you know, model basically has a solution to this, so we look at the tools we have, and then we consider XYZ possibilities. Uh, but now I think there is another side to using counterfactuals in terms of causal reasoning. Um, namely, what about certain possibilities which maybe we cannot measure with the tools we have, right? And then if you have some of these counterfactuals, maybe that could signal that a new tool or a new method is needed in the context. So what do you think about this? Um, so your question is uh, they don't have uh, tools to Measure the yes, so counterfactual. So you don't have a tool, but you have this counterfactual that kind of suggests if we had another tool, so it would be another use of counterfactuals right. in addition to tool of order. Right, right. And then what I think about if that kind of counterfactual and no tool, and what I think mm -hmm. uh, as a philosopher, how what would say about that? Yes. Hmm. Very interesting. Pulling, if I can, if I think about that, I point that out to the scientists. I, I don't know, I don't have an answer to your question, I'm sorry. Yeah, but it's an interesting question. So, I guess the first, because the, the question presupposes that um, there is such things. Um, if there is such things, I, I feel they perhaps uh, scientists then have to like, usually mix that, oh, they still need to control. They still need to do something more than the, what they currently claim. Mm. Yes, or, or try to invent new tools, which is a, a, a lot of cases that uh, it's because the, oh, I have a case, I have an example of mine. So, so in neuroscience, um, they, a, lot of, a lot of people use uh, one, one statistic um, <coughs> uh, for their causal analysis and then, but it's not really uh, ideal for them to uh, uh, use that to analyze the neural connection. And so some, again, a borrow, they don't, they, they always borrow, uh, they borrow granular, granular theory acquisition, which is invented by economists, and then adapt that to, to and of course they involve some uh, 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 adjustment and then uh, apply it to their uh, Neural, neural, neural network analysis. So maybe that's because they also found some counterfactual they need to need to deal with, and they just look for more new look for new tools. Thank you for your question. 
just to plug one of our ex PhD students, if you're interested with this question about the invention of tool and how it's model empiricism, that's a book from this year from one of our ex uh, ex PhDs. That uh, it's exactly about that. Oh, okay. So when you have counterfactual, you try to do an experiment, but then no, 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 how does it work? Okay. I was reading that book recently. <laughs> What's, it, what's the name? It's the Modal Empiricism. Modal okay. Empiricism. The book is called Modal Empiricism. Okay. It's content Okay. So let's thank our speaker. Thank you.